Welcome to The Way. We want to help you connect, grow, and serve. Make sure to plug into a live group for our Ties That Bind series. This is a great chance to dig deeper into the topic of healthy relationships and get more connected to community here at The Way. There are lots of great options to choose from. The men's group and the San Francisco group meet on Mondays. West Oakland and our Adulting 101 group meets on Tuesdays. The Alameda and Fusion group meet on Wednesday. The women's group is on Friday and our weekend group meets on Saturday mornings. We're even offering an online group for our Way family that live outside the Bay Area. Check our website, the app, or Facebook for updated information. You can also sign up for a group you are interested in after service today. Next Sunday, after second service, we will be hosting a Woke Not Broke seminar. Learn strategies to save, build credit, get out of debt, and build wealth. Ask all of your financial questions. Entrepreneur, educator, and artist Jermaine Hughes and wealth manager Cameron Hackett will be leading the seminar, so please join us next Sunday after Second Service here in the Sanctuary. And here's an update on Showers of Blessings. Showers of Blessings is our ministry to serve our houseless brothers and sisters. The encampment that we have typically served at has been dismantled, and so we are needing to reorganize the logistics and find a new site. Until then, Showers of Blessings would like to invite you to come out this Saturday morning from 10 to 11 a.m. and assemble blessing bags for the houseless loved ones in our community. We'll assemble the bags and then distribute them to our congregation the next day, October 13th, so everyone can take them out to be a blessing as you go out in our community. When you see someone at a stoplight or near where you work throughout the day, you can bless them with something practical. So come out this Saturday at 10 a.m. if you want to help assemble blessing bags that we'll distribute the next day. Thank you for worshiping with us today. And everybody's blessed. Everybody's blessed. Give the Lord a hand praise if you're blessed in the house of God today. All right, we are making our way through kind of the introductory phase of our series for the fall ties that bind a relationship a series series on building emotionally healthy relationships and uh, certainly I am uh, have been quite compelled by the lectionary passages for this week uh, passages that uh, may uh, resonate with one of our first steps in our uh, series uh, that calls us to take the community temperature uh, that in many ways our relationships are always grounded in experience and grounded in uh, a particular uh, uh, a set of circumstances that always inform the ways in which our relationships either make sense or don't make sense. Because how many have ever been in relationships with folk and it just don't make no sense? Mm -hmm. It could be on your job, it could be in our society, it can be in your family, man. And so uh, sometimes when things don't make sense and there is dissonance there, uh, it often requires a deep series of reflections and, and, and even some lament. And so Psalms 137 is uh, the passage of scripture that comes out of our lectionary. And uh, there is another passage in Lamentations that talks about the faithfulness of God. Great is the faithfulness of God. And, and so there's, there's just so much good stuff in, in this passage, uh, lectionary for the week. We're going to settle in, though, in, in uh, Psalms 137. I believe I have the message translation on the screen. Amen. And so uh, we'll, 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 we'll start there and invite folks to uh, read along in whatever versions of Scripture that you indeed have. And today certainly is also Communion Sunday, so we intend in about, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes or so to remind ourselves that we are indeed connected to one another. Last week, if you were here, you remember we talked about our relationships must be interdependent and that our relationships, they certainly transcend uh, the individuality of this culture, that we all need one another to survive. And, and so all of this interconnectedness, I hope, allows us to, to, to keep thinking deeply about 
all of these ways we can build healthy relationships. Psalms 137, verse number one. We're actually going to read all nine verses, uh, particularly because uh, the context of today's uh, going zones, if you will, uh, may, may, may give you and I a little bit more uh, biblical theological language to say what some of us may be afraid to say but certainly what God is never threatened by our struggle. Verse number one, the scripture says, alongside Babylon's rivers. Now, Babylon, if you don't know, is uh, the nation, the empire that uh, actually uh, overran the nation of Israel. Uh, it is uh, the, the enemy of Israel. It is an uh, 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 empire that uh, literally massacred all uh, of the, the, the Israelites that were uh, considered to be throwaways. And they carried into exile all of those nobles and learned folks and come the cream of the crop, if you will. And, and, and so whenever uh, we, we read or hear about <clears throat> the exile in Israel's context, many of us who come from uh, the, the African-American experience, the, the, the uh, Mexican-American experience, the indigenous American experience, any, any experience where we have all uh, carry within our genes the, the, the experience of American imperialism, people resonate with this passage, if you knew what this passage was about. And so uh, th this is a, a, a interesting reference to Babylon overtaking and conquering Israel and bringing them all into uh, enslavement and they are now enslaved they are now literally in exile in the nation empire of Babylon and so these are some of the folks who are enslaved in exile and they write this song which I'll talk about in a few minutes alongside Babylon's rivers we sat on the banks we cried and cried Remembering the good old days in Zion. Alongside the quaking aspens, we stacked our unplayed harps. That's where our captors demanded songs, sarcastic and mocking. Sing us a happy Zion song. Verse number four. Oh, how could we ever sing God's song in this wasteland? Some versions say strange land. Some versions say foreign land. If I ever forget you, Jerusalem, let my fingers wither and fall off like leaves. Let my tongue swell and turn black. If I fail to remember you, if I fail, oh dear Jerusalem, to honor you as my greatest. Verse number seven, God remember those Edomites and remember the ruin of Jerusalem. That day they yelled out, wreck it, smash it to bits. And to you, Babylonians, ravagers, a reward to whoever gets back at you for all you've done to us. Yes, a reward to the one who grabs your babies and smashes their heads on the rocks. Word of God for us, the people of God, let us say thanks be to God. All right, so uh, we're going to talk a little bit today about the strange land experience. Uh, bow your heads with me as we pray. God, the word of God has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And may the preaching and teaching of your word bring healing and victory and strength and hope. This is our prayer in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them we're going to make it through the strange land. We're going to make it through the wasteland. We're going to make it through these unfamiliar situations. Now, one of our greatest challenges as followers of the ways of Jesus is navigating through strange or foreign or as the message translation characterizes them, wastelands. Uh, the strange land refers to the season of human history or your own personal experience where we feel forsaken by God and or conquered by our enemies, where Murphy's Law seems to be uh, functioning in our lives. You know, 
This idea that everything that could go wrong does go wrong. Anybody felt that recently? You know, it's like I, I did all that I knew how to do, and I prayed, I fasted, I gave my tithes, I came to church most of the time. Uh, I, 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 I went to work, I, I was on time most of the time. I, I, <laughs> I, I didn't, I stopped lying as much. I don't steal and cheat like I used to. You know, just doing the best you can. Anybody doing the best you can, right? But it becomes certainly a sense that the hell that I'm going through does not match what I am contributing to this relationship, to the world, to my circumstance. The strange land is an existential crisis, a crisis that often is uh, beyond just the concreteness of your challenge, but it is a place where experientially, existentially, relationally, your hope and your reality do not align. Mm -hmm. And one could argue that, you know, uh, strange lands, existential crisis, uh, crises are not discriminatory. Meaning that if you live long enough, <laughs> you gonna go through a strange land. It's not as if you could do everything right and somehow skip the strange land. That, you know, you being black, you being poor, you being rich, you being wealthy, you being a citizen, you being undocumented, you having a home, you not having a home, you still gonna go through a crisis. But I think it's worth saying and noting that even though strange lands are not discriminatory, they are indeed contextual. Meaning that even though all of us will experience it, all of us will endure times when we are aware of our sojourn there, our situatedness, dare I say, the way we are relate, related to the ties that bind us to systems or to structures or to power or to people, they all will inform our meaning making while we are processing and going through the strange land. Meaning that depending on how you are connected and to whom you are connected and to where you are connected, your strange land will unleash all kinds of responses that left uninterrogated could either contribute to you going through it or setting up camp in it. I think it's worth noting that we are all people in process. That no circumstance you go through is intended to be your permanent residence. I often tell people, you know, that uh, I was born into a black holiness Pentecostal fourth generation church business family. <laughs> Amen. It, it, it's, we just we just call this the family business, you know. Some people's family business is, you know, uh, selling sausage or, or, or architecture or, you know, I don't know, uh, 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 sports or our family business is church. Somebody say amen. And so my experience has taught me since we are at church that uh, being connected to church often creates all kinds of responses to strange land. Some people will spiritualize it. Dare I say over-spiritualize it. Some folks will find their strange lands to be, to make them cynical. Some will just get on a, uh, a, uh, uh, 
uh, autopilot and just keep doing practices and rituals until the light comes back on. Right. Others will isolate themselves and just go totally within. And I believe that all of these responses potentially are honored by God. Some will get very angry and some will, 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 will move to a place of, 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 of reconciliation relatively quickly, too quickly for some of us. Uh, and and, and it, it, it is worth reminding ourselves that the spectrum of human existence and our responses to human challenges is a reflection of why God's greatness must always be held in tension with our limitations. Because if God can be with you wherever you are, God can be with us wherever we are, all at the same time. It helps you and I to appreciate that God's greatness far outpaces and surpasses our limitations. It'd be one thing if we read scripture and we found that God was only angry in response to our worst conditions, or God was only merciful, or God was only forgiving, or God was only forgetful. As a matter of fact, we find many kinds of presentation of God's response to our strange lands. As I said last week in the sermon, when the scripture introduces God uh, to Moses and, 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 and Moses says, who are you? And God says, I am that I am. Meaning, I will be whatever I will be. Amen. It, it, it reminds you and I that we are contextual people. That God is everything all at once. <laughs> While you and I can probably only be one thing at a time. <laughs> and not even that well. Somebody say amen, right? I mean, I don't know if you ever thought you was real good being petty and you realize mm, I'm not as good at this as I thought I was. You thought you was real good being, being, being functional and then you realize uh, I, I got some growing edges. But God can be everything for all of us at the same time. Oh, we serve a great God. Amen. But it also forces me to think about our limitations as a church. Not just the way, but the church universal. Today is World Communion Day. And so all across the world, literally, uh, churches are trying to remind and proclaim that we are one body. We are the Lord's body. With lots of different names on the front of the building, but how many know we are still one body the Lord's body. And yet, as I look at this body, I often am reminded that there is a lot of unfaithfulness, if not heretical expressions of Christian faith at work in the world. I pray that we're not one of them, amen. Certainly, I hope we are being as faithful as we can, but you know, there's always a lot of unfaithfulness still at work among the faithful. But in this moment, I believe that one of our most important charges as we endure these strange experiences of trying to follow Jesus faithfully in the wasteland called America is how can we continue to have relationships with God, self, and others that reject and refuse to participate in an unfaithful expression of Christian faith that would like to limit us in one place when God has enough room for you to be wherever you are. Mm. And God is still at home with you. 
J.B. Phillips, he writes that the trouble with many people today is that they have not found a God big enough for modern needs. So while their experience of life has grown in a score of different directions and their emotional horizons have been expanded to the point of bewilderment by world events and scientific discoveries, their ideas of God have remained particularly static, stale, and small. This is the dilemma we have. That when we find ourselves in an existential crisis in a wasteland, rather than leaning into the greatness of God, we embrace a gospel that is often too small. And we end up shrinking God to fit into our preferred response rather than leaning into God so God can stretch us and expand our capacity to be more than who we are today. Now, of course, if it is indeed the case that God is with us wherever we are, and I do believe that to be the case, uh, I, I think then that there are some, some, some steps you and I can make uh, wherever we are in these kinds of existential crises uh, that will allow us to make it through the strange land with a stronger faith. One of the other passages uh, that were in the lectionary today was Luke chapter number 16. Uh, and, 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 and the disciples uh, pretty much just came up to Jesus and said, Lord, increase our faith. Man, I, I almost preached on that today. Amen. Because my faith at some times can get small real quick. <laughs> Amen. Y'all, y'all, any y'all Marvel fans out there, you, 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 you know Ant Man, right? You know he, he got a little button, and that button make him blow up or make him shrink. Amen. Well, sometimes my faith can be like that. Be like I accidentally hit the button and I shrink. I got any other shrinking folk up in here today, amen. It's like, Lord, my faith done, where'd it go, amen? It was in my hand. <laughs> well, one of the first things that I think the scripture brings to us today is we must first decenter falsehoods that come from the empire. Decenter falsehoods that come from the entire empire. Somebody say, decenter empire and falsehoods. Now, I am convinced that the work of the preacher and even the church in an age of terror like we're living in today is to remind all of us that God has not forsaken us and that God is not mocked. God is not overly tied to our inconsistencies, our idiosyncrasies, our half-truths, our limited vision that the empire, these falsehoods, these ways of life that, that we are often tied to, that we often internalize, that God is not limited by our partial view. We talk in, uh, at the way, one of our, our kind of core values is we call it de-churchification. Some of you that may, you know, be a little more educated in, in the ways of, of academic reflection and inquiry, you may call it decolonization. Or some of y'all that just woke, you learned a big word on Facebook. Somebody say amen, right? And, 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 but all of it is to suggest that you and I must not take for granted that what you were handed uncritically is enough to help you make it through this crisis of faith. That often what you were given was intended to be the foundation, not the house. Uh -huh. uh, 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 you know, I, 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 I think that, that because I was raised and introduced to Pentecostal Christian faith, uh, it serves for me as my foundation, but it is not the house. That all of us don't get to choose what tradition we are introduced to, but we always get to choose how we grow and learn and, 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 and expand the, the, the teachings and the learnings that help us. Uh, I, I, 
I believe that right now, given all of the evil and wickedness that is going on in the world, that we must challenge ourselves not to become disciples of an American Christo-fascism. Mm -hmm. This is uh, a, 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 a wonderful description by Dorothy Soleil, I think is how you say her name. She was a, 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 a liberation theologian out of uh, Nazi Germany. And I'm getting ready to read Dietrich Bonhoeffer in a second too because uh, Christofascism and cheap grace, I think, are both things that you and I must reject if we are going to decenter empire and falsehoods that are not adequate to carry you and I through the strange land. Christofascism is a combination of Christian and fascist ideas that, that make sense of the empire's efforts to use violence and subjugation in the name of God. And although many of us are, 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 are very patriotic and we have these nationalistic tendencies as we saw in the passage, uh, how many of you know that one of our greatest tasks as followers of Jesus is to remind the empire that God never sides with her? Mm -hmm. That the empire is always at odds with God. That God is never on the side of any empire. You can sing, um, our, what, what's some songs these sings? God bless America, God is not blessing an empire. You can say, uh, under God with liberty, God ain't blessing an empire. You can say, my country tis of thee sweet. God is not blessing an empire because empires attempt to put themselves in a place that only God can. Right. Only God is the creator and the sustainer, listen, and the owner of heaven and earth. Empires try to take over that which it does not own, uh, including your body. I wish I had a witness in here today. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them the empire don't own my body. Mm -hmm. But what does it mean to draw theological resources from our faith? So when the empire attempts to take uh, a hold of our bodies, of our minds, of our soul, and of our spirit, that we can indeed reject that project and say, I belong to God. And even though I'm going through a tough season, I know that the God that brought me to it will be the same God that brings me through it. And this is why the prophetic witness of the black church and other uh, faithful expressions or more faithful expressions of church in America, even our interfaith partners is so crucial for today because this country loves to weaponize forgiveness as a tool to uphold empire. Man, this is where Dietrich Bonhoeffer is very helpful because he says that cheap grace is the grace we bestow on ourselves. Mm -hmm. Grace is a gift that comes from God that is unmerited. You can do nothing to deserve it. This is the theological gift of grace. But empire and we who get too seduced by empire will think that we have grace to bestow on ourselves and others. But what can you give to people when you don't have it yourself? Cheap grace is the grace we bestow on ourselves. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. Mm, hello, somebody. Baptism without church discipline, communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. I want you to know that the combination of Christofascism and cheap grace is at work among us and all of us are at risk of being subsumed in a project that may offer individuals forgiveness, but leave the rest of the world, and dare I say, America, still condemned. 
It is not our job to absolve evil. It is our job to defeat it, to overcome it, to bear witness that there is another way that this temporary pit stop called the strange land can never overcome or defeat. And this is why the conversation with us about our relationships, our relational ties to empire, our relational ties to power and hegemony is important because we must be honest about the pain of oppression and ask if we are the, if we who are oppressed are also at times becoming the oppressor at the same time. And again, it's so, oh, you know, I can be oppressed and still oppress others. Maybe not at the same scale, but oppression is always about power. So, you know, you know, you people, people, people go come home from their job where they don't like their boss and then they take it out on their partner or their children. <laughs> or maybe, maybe, maybe you got a supervisor and you know they, uh, the, the best one is the flashlight cops. I don't I hate on nobody, you know, but people, they give them a little bit of power in a mall and they think that the mall is theirs. The mall ain't yours. <laughs> Somebody say amen. I told people all the time, you better not give me no job at the mall because everything is gone, amen. I'm like, I wouldn't do that if I was you, but hey, you know, they got insurance. Somebody say amen, no. But there are falsehoods that if we don't interrogate while we are going through strange land experiences, because I do believe the strange land, the existential crises we face bring to surface many of the things that we should leave in the wasteland. And if there is indeed unfaithful and false ideologies and teachings that we have brought into the wasteland, my prayer is that while we are there, God will teach us how to be more faithful as we go through it. So when we come out of it, we are not playing out those very things that perhaps oppress others along the way. So the first question I want you to think about, what falsehoods and ways of being human must you unlearn while you are in this strange and foreign wasteland? There's a lot of unprogramming, deprogramming that you and I must do, unlearning that you and I must do when we get into these places. And, and, I, and I, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, about where that happens in this next point, but I want you to appreciate that whenever you're going through a trial, ask God, what must I learn as I'm going through this thing? The trial is not coming to destroy you, it's coming to sharpen you. The scripture says, count it all joy when various trials and temptations come your way. Why? Because it perfects your faith. Amen. I, 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 I like how it reads. I don't like what it means, though. Amen. Because I'm not one of the people that cheer on my trials. I'm like, Lord, hurry up, get me up out of here. Amen. I, I learned, I've learned enough. <laughs> Have you ever told God that? I've learned enough, God. I promise you, Lord, I, I've learned all I can today. When, when is recess up in here? <laughs> what new sources of truth and healing are within your faith and cultural traditions that can tie you or bind you to life? This is such an important point because if it is indeed the case that our faith and our, 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 our ideologies are, are both conscious and unconscious, ways of being that have been left uninterrogated by us are, are, are percolating the apps playing in the back of our consciousness and our mind. It's important for you and I to, 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 to keep interrogating and finding some new sources of truth that are still at work in our human experience. 
There are so many folk who have gone through what we've gone through and have left some breadcrumbs along the way to help you and I get through it with our faith intact. I love the Christian tradition. It is so diverse. Uh, you know, we, 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 we can look at 2,000 at least years of, of, of Christian reflection uh, since the days of Jesus. And if you go uh, into the, the, uh, the Hebrew text, you can get up to about 4,000 more years or so. So you got about four to 5,000 years of, of reflection about how people have endured hardship. And like I said, their endurance was never identical. They, they all endured in different kinds of ways. People, you know, so interesting. I'm not going to stay this too much longer, but, you know, with, 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 with the forgiveness uh, spectacle that's been on the airways all week, you know, I had somebody, you know, tell me that, you know, another preacher, he was like, you know, McBride, uh, you too angry because Jesus only forgave his enemies. Wow. And I said, well, um, I, I do remember Jesus clearing out the temple and uh, unless he was forgiven for a while, he was putting his hands on them. Amen. Uh, I got another model I can draw strength from, too. Somebody say amen. I'm not telling nobody to go put your hands on nobody. I'm just telling you that, you know, Jesus did do a few other things, too. <laughs> Jesus said, uh, some of you can't, can't, thought I came to create peace, but I come to start a fire come to burn this world up. I wish it was on fire today. That's what Jesus said. It wasn't McBride. So let's just try to balance it all out. Somebody say amen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now let me get off this point. My whole sermon is going to go down the drain. Amen. <laughs> Decenter empire and falsehoods. The second thing that I think is critical for you and I to do if we're going to make it through the strange land is find your river. <clears throat> Scripture says that by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat and we wept when we remembered Zion. Lord, I could preach on this for about an hour. I'm going to give you about 10 minutes of my, my best 10 minutes of this hour. There is always a river in your wasteland. Sometimes the river exists before you got there. Sometimes the river will be populated with your tears or the tears of those that came before you. But there's always a river. What is the significance of river and water in the biblical text? Water always represented safety because in the biblical text, and certainly in most, most ancient times, and even still perhaps today, if your empire or if your castle or if your nation was by a river, you constantly had the ability to outlast all of your enemies. Because the goal of most armies were to surround the city and wait till they ran out of food and water. And then they would come out and surrender. But if you're by a river, if you're by an ocean, a body of water, you'll never run out. God will never take you to a wasteland without you being able to find a river a place where you can find safety and security while you are in the wasteland. A place where you can get nourishment and life while you are in a wasteland. Why? Because by these rivers, the process of being human in the wasteland takes its course. You see, in, 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 in many of our lives, we go through wasteland experiences and we rush too quickly to resolution. 
because we lack the resources to be able to sit in the ugliness and the pain of human tragedy and trauma. So because we know we don't have enough time to mourn, enough time to heal, enough time to ask God some hard questions, we'll quickly go to a resolution. Blessed and highly favored. But what if some of us slowed the process down a little bit? Why? Because like I said, God is big enough to sit with you wherever you are. God's not trying to rush you to a resolution when healing is where you are in the process. The river represents the place where you can be restored, where you can be made Oh, listen, the river also represents a place of communal gathering with like-minded individuals. By the rivers, we sat and wept. Didn't say I. Uh -huh. Which means that mourning and healing and restoration is always a communal exercise. Healthy relationships are at work among us when we all can sit together with faith and go through the process of human experience. There is a supernatural infusion that will arise eventually, but it is never on a timeline of human agency. It is God. Uh, I like C.S. Lewis, he had wrote a book called Surprise by Joy. At the moment I least expected it, God surprised me with joy and peace and healing. But it was because I found a river. Wherever you are in your journey, find you a river. Don't, don't, don't be so fast to go to the resolution. Don't be so fast to join everybody else's train towards a resolution. If you need to take some time, tell you, hey, I'm, 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 I found me a river, and I'm going to just hang out here for a second. My prayer is if you my friend, if you my comrade, if you my sojourner, you going to park here with me for a little while too. Because it's by the river you get reminded of God's faithfulness. So, question, is there a river nearby in your wasteland? Can you identify where your river is? As you're going through your challenge, can you identify where your river is? And who, what, and where are you tied to that renews your hope while you make your sojourn in the strange land? Because be clear, hopelessness is as deadly as a bullet. So the river is necessary for you to keep hope. But the river is still a pit stop. And the river is also necessary for you to retrieve your harps. Scripture says, there we hung our harps on the trees by the rivers. Don't forget where you laid your tools down. The tools given to us to resist wickedness and evil. Pick those tools, retrieve those tools, because eventually you're going to need those tools. When God strengthens you to move you on, you're going to need those same tools to defeat the enemies of God at work, in our lives, our communities, our relationships, and dare I say, even at work within ourselves. Come on, stand with me, everyone, as we prepare to pray and ask God to give us tools to make it through the strange land. Grab the hand of someone next to you, if you don't mind. God, my brother, my sister, my loved one who I'm touching today, we are indeed traversing through a strange land. Daily, we are being reminded of the wickedness of empire, the, the, the death that seems to overwhelm us. 
both in our families, in our country, in our communities. But God, I believe that we can make it through the strange land when we decenter empire and put you, the true expression of hope and joy and peace at the center. God, when we are able to ensure that our actions are not attempting to make sense or valorize or dare I even say let off the hook Lord the wickedness of empire or abuse or oppression but God we are seeking to be faithful in ways that defang the teeth that seeks to harm the faithful so I pray for the loved one I'm touching today as they deal and struggle and traverse through this season of challenge and difficulty as they come out of this season of challenge or difficulty may they know God that there is something that they came into the wasteland with that they have now exchanged for more power spiritual power hope filled power Holy Ghost power now lift those hands where you're standing. It's me, God, and I stand in the need of prayer. It is not my mother or father, my sister or my brother, but it's me, Lord, and I need you. I need your love. I need your strength. I need your power. I need your wisdom. I need you to help me make sense, God, of the foolishness that is at work in the world, the evil that is at work in the world and our role in being faithful in the face of the evil. I pray, God, that you will bring comfort to those who mourn, justice to those who are oppressed, peace to those who are troubled, healing to those who are harmed, restoration to those who have been wronged, and God, clarity to those who are confused. I pray that as I lift my hands to you, today, God, that you will save me from my sins. I pray, God, that you will give me what I need to be reminded that the strange land is a temporary pit stop to a place of glory, a place of healing, a place of faithfulness, in Jesus' name we pray. Hug two or three people and tell them we're going to make it through the strange land. We're going to make it through the strange land. We're going to make it. We're going to make it through the strange land.